Good afternoon. My name is John Lindahl. I'd like to welcome you to the Nebraska State Historical Society's Brown Bag Lecture Series, held here at the Museum of Nebraska History on the third Thursday of every month. And a detailed schedule for this series, as well as information about all of the Society's programs and services, can be found on our website, which is at nebraskahistory.org. Before I introduce today's speaker, I would like to thank the Nebraska State Historical Society Foundation for funding the filming of these lectures. Their financial support allows us to tape and broadcast these programs on public access television. Our speaker today is Jim Potter, Nebraska State Historical Society senior historian. His topic is running for president in 1908, Bryan versus Taft in which he compares the present election with the 1908 campaign, which pitted Nebraskan William Jennings Bryan, the Democrat, against Republican William Howard Taft. Please welcome Jim Potter. Thank you, John, and thank all of you for coming today to uh, join me in taking a look back at presidential politics from a century ago. Uh, this was a time when Nebraska was really in the political spotlight because of our own William Jennings Bryan, who was the only Nebraska resident that's been the presidential candidate of a major American political party. And not only that, he, he accomplished the, the feat of becoming the nominee three times, but he also was defeated three times. Nevertheless, Bryan's political legacy affects us to this day, even though the only elections he ever won were two terms as congressman from Nebraska in the early 1890s. I guess I should show you, Bryan. Now at the centennial of Bryan's last presidential race, it seems appropriate to recall a few highlights from that campaign and review why his political career mattered. Ryan's biographers and other scholars credit him with a leading role in transforming the Democratic Party from a conservative states' rights party that believed in minimalist government to one that advocated social, political, and economic reform. Ryan was committed to popular democracy, but as time went on, he became convinced that for democracy to work, government intervention was necessary to curb the excesses of an industrial market economy. Free coinage of silver was his major issue during his first campaign in 1896. Well before 1908, Bryan had dropped the money question and promoted a progressive agenda that included direct election of U.S. Senators, guarantee of bank deposits, an income tax, regulation of corporations and railroads, woman suffrage, and fair labor laws. He lived to see most of these reforms enacted. The losers in modern presidential elections usually don't get second chances. As far as I was able to recall, and not always from personal experience, since Bryan's day, only Thomas Dewey, who lost to FDR and again to Harry Truman, Adlai Stevenson, who was twice defeated by Dwight D. Eisenhower, and Richard Nixon, who recovered from his 1960 loss to JFK to win the presidency in 1968 and 1972, are, are the only exceptions for losers who made a comeback. Despite Bryan's three defeats, and of course, uh, as I also think only Henry Clay ever matched Bryan in presidential election futility, Bryan continued to lead the Democratic Party and led it for more than a decade and remained one of its towering figures for a quarter of a century. During his active political years, Bryan enjoyed tremendous personal popularity, which clearly did not always translate into political, political success. His popular following can be explained in part because in his interactions with people, Bryan seemed more like a friendly neighbor, genuinely concerned with their welfare, than as a politician focused only on his own achievements and fame. He did not get the nickname the Great Commoner for nothing. His engaging personality, his sincere enjoyment of the simple pursuits of rural and small town life, and his ability to make people feel at ease in his presence help explain why he was so likable. These qualities enhanced his appeal as a public speaker, and even his political enemies conceded him these gifts. 
In the spring of 1908, on the eve of a major political campaign, and despite a massive correspondence totaling thousands of letters per day, Bryan still found time to write a heartfelt personal letter to the Lincoln Committee that was organizing local Mother's Day observances. In this letter, Bryan paid tribute to the sweet and lasting influence of the mother upon the child and other recollections of his own childhood. Later that month, I believe that was May of 1908, he gave the commencement address at College View High School, which had then only a handful of graduates. It is hard to see these gestures as politically motivated, but rather as examples of Brian's genuine desire to take part in the life of the community he, he had called home since 1887 when he moved here to Lincoln. In 1908, as this year, the presidential candidates were already known before the party conventions. Unlike today's method of selecting candidates, however, there were no presidential primaries in 1908, and convention delegates were selected at state party conventions. While the battle for delegates may have been fierce, it did not drag on for months in full public view. Bryan had been quietly building support for his candidacy for nearly two years, both among party functionaries and the Democratic masses. After the, the Democratic Party's disastrous defeat in the 1904 election in which Bryan had been passed over by party conservatives, he was considered as the only choice if the Democrats were to have a realistic chance of winning the White House in 1908. I'm not sure if this cartoon actually dates from 1908 or perhaps issued earlier, but it, it clearly shows that the cartoonist saw Brian in the ascendancy, the Brian sun is rising again, uh, leading to the 1908 election. As his opponent, William Howard Taft, the Republican was then U.S. Secretary of War and President Theodore Roosevelt's hand-picked successor to be the Republican standard bearer. Now, Bryan did not attend the Democratic Convention, which was held in Denver in 1908, as it will be again this year. There's the place it was held, the, the auditorium, which is, I'm sure, no longer standing. Bryan did not go to the convention, but he had a telegraph line installed at Fairview, his rural Lincoln residence, so he could keep in constant touch with his brother Charles. Charles is shown here with uh, the rest of the Bryan siblings, including their three sisters. Charles was basically William Jennings' uh, campaign manager, if you will, and so Charles did go to Denver, and he wanted to be there, of course, to make sure there were no surprises, even though Bryan had pretty well laid the groundwork uh, well before the convention. Uh, William Jennings Bryan had uh, done most of the work drafting the Democratic Party platform, and as it was actually approved or acted upon at the Denver convention, he, he personally approved every little change that might have been made, or, and there weren't many. Uh, as Charles stayed on the, on the telegraph, or possibly, uh, I think there may have been a telephone line installed as well, and Charles relayed everything that was going on. This cartoon actually uh, reflects a, a minor bit of concern that, uh, that Brian had that some of the, the uh, more conservative, uh, wealthier Democratic forces, including a Wall Street financier named Thomas Ryan, were going to try to derail his... Uh, his uh, candidacy in at the convention. They didn't have much chance of doing that, but uh, as this cartoon shows, uh, uh, Brian was well in control uh, of things that happened at, at Denver. And in fact, the convention was such a, a bland affair that journalist William Allen White called it as fizzless as a can of milk. <laughs> Now, Fairview in 1908, because it was here in Lincoln, centrally located, it was really a mecca for visits to Bryan by Democratic Party dignitaries who were on their way to or from the convention in Denver. Bryan had made no advanced selection of a running mate, and he approved the convention's choice of John Kern of Indiana, who, had, who then stopped at Fairview where this photograph was taken and had a meeting with Bryan on July 13th. Also visiting Fairview was Samuel Gompers, head of the American Federation of Labor, who had requested and succeeded in having pro-labor planks included in the Democratic platform. Gompers had first approached the Republicans at their convention in June and had been shown the door, basically, with the admonition, go to Denver. So Gompers went to Denver, and as a result, the 1908 election marked the first 
time that organized labor really hitched its wagon to the democratic donkey. From this modest beginning, of course, labor's relationship with the Democratic Party would continue to strengthen. The presidential nominees in 1908 did not give their acceptance speeches at the conventions, as is the custom today. Bryan was officially notified of his nomination during August 12th, 1908 ceremonies held on the north portico of the state capitol here in Lincoln. This photograph is of that event. There, Brian accepted the nomination, outlined the platform on which he would run, arraigned the Republican Party and its platform, and I think the speech, uh, according to the newspaper, was about two hours in the August sun. And you can see here that uh, this is Norman Mack, the head of the Democratic uh, uh, National Committee, and he's holding the umbrella for Brian, although there are other pictures showing Brian speaking that doesn't have the umbrella. An interesting sidelight to this, uh, this particular event, seated on the platform with the other dignitaries and forced to listen to Brian attack his party was Republican Governor of Nebraska, George L. Sheldon. That's governor Sheldon right there. He doesn't have a smile on his face, as you can see. And of course, the governor, being a Republican, probably would have liked to have been elsewhere, but I think uh, the protocol of the day re sort of required him to be there, even if he didn't, uh, didn't feel comfortable politically. Uh, that's uh, Vice Presidential nominee John Kern. You can tell it's hot. He's wiping his brow. Or maybe he's just getting so bored with what Brian's saying that he's starting to fall asleep. And I suppose Mrs. Brian's in here somewhere, but I, I think she's probably obscured by other people. But it was a big crowd, and it was a big deal in Lincoln. They had flags and bunting all over the streets and bands and the whole ball of wax. Only after the notification here at, in Lincoln did the formal campaign for president begin, which had the benefit of limiting its duration to a little more than two months. Both candidates were imposing figures. Bryan was 48 years old in 1908 and robust at nearly 200 pounds. He had tr tremendous stamina and well deserved his reputation as a gifted public speaker. Willa Cather described him in 1900 as, quote, a big, well-planted man standing firmly on the soil as though he belonged there and were rooted to it, with powerful shoulders, exhilarating freedom of motion, and a smile that won him more votes than his logic ever did." End quote. <laughs> Brian's biographer, or principal biographer, Paolo Coletta, described Brian as more a preacher and exhorter than as a politician and statesman. Nonetheless, Brian was a master of stagecraft and drew enormous crowds in a day when political oratory was highly valued. Now, the Republican candidate, William Howard Taft, at 300 pounds or more, dwarfed Brian physically and was slightly older. Taft was not a noted public speaker and he hated campaigning. One account from the period described his personality as sluggish attributed both to his weight and to his typical breakfast of a dozen eggs, a pound of bacon, and mounds of pancakes. Yet he was Yale-educated, an experienced jurist, and had performed well as civilian governor of the Philippines and as Secretary of War in Roosevelt's cabinet. Here the two are pictured together in a, in a campaign postcard from 1908. Despite any shortcomings that Taft may have had as a politician, Theodore Roosevelt believed he was the right man to carry on the progressive Republican program that had come to the fore during Roosevelt's presidency. In pondering the attributes of the 1908 presidential candidates, it occurred to me that like this year's presumptive nominees, the Democrat had the edge in personal charisma and speaking ability, was a voice for change in Washington, seemed in the best of health, and it assumed the mantle of spokesman on behalf of, behalf of average Americans in opposing policies seeming to favor big business and the wealthy. The Republican candidate in 1908 represented the Washington establishment, lacked the energy and star power of his younger opponent, and his physical fitness for enduring the burdens of the presidency surely could have been questioned had obesity then been recognized as the serious health risk that it is today. In 1908, however, many voters were probably not as aware of the contrast between the nominee's physical attributes and personalities. Americans then had far less exposure to the candidates than they do now. 
The 1908 election represented an era of transition from campaigns in which the parties played the major role to those in which the candidates became the focal point. The parties concentrated on mobilizing pre-existing loyalties rather than making converts. Throughout most of the 19th century, the parties energized voters with rallies, torchlight parades, and political clubs. Here, for example, is a, a scene right here in Lincoln, a political rally, which may very well be from the 1908 campaign with, with bands marching and banners flying and so forth. On election day, party discipline got the faithful to the polls. The parties controlled the election of U.S. Senators, which were then done by the state legislators, legislatures, the selection of convention delegates and the dispensation of political patronage. Most Americans voted their party ticket, and the individual who happened to be the nominee was secondary. This system produced high voter turnout. In 1908, for example, some 65% of eligible voters, which of course did not include women, cast ballots far higher than in modern elections, although already dropping from even higher percentages characteristic of the 19th century. Bryan often told a story that illustrated the strength of party loyalty. While he was campaigning in a western state, a stranger approached and said, quote, I have ridden 50 miles to hear you speak tonight. I have always read every speech of yours that I could get a hold of. I would ride a hundred miles to hear you make a speech and buy gum if I wasn't a Republican, I'd vote for you." <laughs> End quote. Before radio, newsreels, and television, the electorate could form a, an impression of the candidates and particularly their physical attributes only from, say, photographs, uh, from personal appearances that they made during their extensive campaign swings, newspaper accounts, and so forth. Despite Bryan's prodigious campaigning in 1908 and in his earlier races as well, many voters probably never saw or heard him speak in person. Those who were exposed to Bryan's political views through subscriptions to his Lincoln newspaper, The Commoner, or by reading his books and published speeches were probably already sympathetic to his cause. In fact, Bryan can be credited with initiating the personal presidential campaign in 1896 when he crisscrossed the country by train, traveling thousands of miles and giving hundreds of speeches. The Democratic Party could not compete financially with the Republicans in producing campaign literature or by bringing trainloads of voters to meet the candidates at home in what was called a front porch campaign. Because Bryan's energy and his oratorical gifts were the Democrats' greatest assets, Bryan took to the road. As progressive reforms such as primary elections, the initiative and referendum, civil service regulations, and direct election of senators began to weaken party control over the campaigns and over the post-election patronage in the early 20th century, the candidates became more important along with the rise of special interest groups. New technology improved candidates' ability to deliver their message directly to the voters. A relatively modern phenomenon is the political, political debate Although there were none in 1908, I have to think Brian would have fared well in a face-to-face -face meeting with Taft. Lacking radio and television coverage, however, had such a debate been held, it likely would have done little to change voters' minds. Reading about a debate in the newspapers, which the, themselves in those days were certainly uh, not necessarily objective, uh, would have probably been a very poor substitute for hearing or seeing the candidates in action. Brian and Taft actually did meet face to face only once during the 1908 campaign, and that was at a nonpartisan event, the annual banquet of the Chicago Association of Commerce. The two men exchanged pleasantries during short, informal addresses, and Brian was already seated on the platform when the audience saw Taft come in, and the paper described it as Taft's huge frame, quote, moving like a ship amongst tugs, slowly coming up the aisle. Taft did campaign here in Lincoln in late September 1908, and he made five speeches, but Bryan was not in town because he was out somewhere else campaigning. A unique feature of the 1908, whoops, we're going to go back. A unique feature of the 1908 campaign was the appearance of the political postcard. 
Some were partisan and referenced campaign issues in a mini poster format, while others merely identified the candidates, often in a humorous way. Some were forerunners of what we know today as negative campaigning. They probably had little effect upon the election's outcome, but they do provide a fertile field for collectors of political ephemera. The picture postcard reached its heyday in the first years of the 20th century, so it is no surprise that they were soon adapted for political purposes. The Nebraska State Journal newspaper here in Lincoln in August 1908 predicted, however, that the card's main benefits would be to, quote, help diminish the annual postal deficit. <laughs> Nevertheless, the postcards anticipated future political patterns by simplifying issues and putting the focus on the candidates. I've just got a selection of some that I'll show you here. These, I, these first group I would call ID cards. They, uh, they don't really have a major political message. And of course, these, this one connects Brian to Nebraska very well with the corn. This one, uh, I'm not sure exactly what it's supposed to mean. Uh, um, it could mean that uh, Brian wanted to regulate the railroads, or it could mean that he was just on the trains all the time, which is certainly true as well. This one actually was copyrighted before the, uh, before the election, if you'll notice down below. Here's, uh, here's a basic ID card. There's Taft uh, just staring out at the, at the audience. This one is designed to be sort of humorous, and of course, uh, if you took away the picture of Brian, it isn't really even a political card. In fact, you could make a Taft card by just pasting Taft's picture on there, but uh, an example of the kind of cards that were circulating at that time. Here's one, of course, that is uh, an effort to collect, connect uh, Brian to his party, and uh, if you pull the tail, you get Brian popping out. <laughs> Then there were some that uh, made much of the fact that you had uh, both candidates being named William, and so either way, the president was bound to be Bill. And I thought to myself, well, I don't know if that looks like Taft, but it certainly doesn't look like Brian's profile. It looks more like uh, Ebenezer Scrooge or somebody, but anyway, so they, they didn't, uh, they weren't terribly careful in, in uh, making sure that some of these things really resembled anyone. Then you have what I would call issue cards that do actually try to, to make a political statement. Here's a, a good one uh, that tries to, does contrast Brian as the, the champion of the little man, the guy that does actually go out in the hay field. And he did occasionally go out at Fairview and do a little work on the farm. And so he's, uh, you know, he's being tied in with, with the rail splitter. Whereas Taft, of course, is the, the uh, tool of, of Wall Street and, and industrial interests, uh, plays golf, the plutocrat. And uh, Taft did play golf, by the way. I guess he was maybe the first president that really played golf. And I believe just after he got the nomination, before the campaign really got underway, his doctors advised him to lose some weight. So he went out and played golf for about two or three weeks. But he probably ate while he was doing it. So here's another one, of course. This, uh, this is, again, an effort to simplify the issues. Uh, uh, if Brian gets elected, he'll kick out the, uh, the trusts, and, and the Democratic donkey is, of course, uh, giving them a pounding. And, of course, the GOP elephant's looking the other way while these trusts have been inhabiting the government and, and, and weaseling their, their influence into the White House. The, uh, this one is from the 1908 campaign, and it's an effort for the, of the Democrats to uh, get more support from the, the, the working man, uh, that the Republican dinner pail is, is defunct. And if you, want, uh, if you want to have a full dinner pail, why vote for the Democrats. Then you get into what I really do think are kind of like negative campaigning, certainly. Here's, uh, here's one that shows Brian as various forms of little old ladies and, and uh, sort of crackpot uh, imagery. Uh, wearing all these different hats and <clears throat> suggesting perhaps that Brian just tells people what they want to hear depending on who he's talking to. The whole Democratic Party is here. Uh, this must have been produced by the Republicans for sure. Uh, here's probably about the most negative one I, I found uh, relating to Brian. Uh, he's a cuckoo. He's a nut. Uh, if you look up at the top, uh, he being, uh, Brian being the clock, he'll keep on running and, and and, uh, and it'll soon make him a bunch of money, even if the alarm doesn't go off, sort of suggesting that 
all of his issues have been sort of radical, alarmist things, and you don't want to have this nut in the White House. But by golly, if he doesn't make it this time, he might run again in, in 1912. And then finally, and I assume this came out uh, before the election, but it, it tur turned out to be sort of true in the end because three, he did go three strikes, but he didn't really go out. I mean, he still stayed active in, in politics for a long time and was still a leader of the party for, or a major leader of the party for some time. But clearly, again, uh, whoever produced this card wanted, uh, wanted Brian to get out of politics and go back to, to his farm and pitch some hay. Now, Brian campaigned in 1908 at about the same frantic pace that he had demonstrated in the two earlier elections in 1896 and 1900. He spent about 60 days on the road, uh, giving as many as 24 speeches a day, and his exertions finally forced Taft, who hated to go out and talk, apparently, uh, but it finally forced Taft to go, to go to the stump as well, as they said in those days. And Roosevelt was kind of pushing Taft to get out there, get out there, we can't let Brian just uh, go around the country un unopposed. Late in October, the locomotive on Brian's uh, special campaign train broke down, but uh, Brian did not break down. He held up through, through, uh, through the end and gave his final speech here in Lincoln on the evening of November 2nd, which was the day before the election. Then he went back to Fairview and sat there and waited till the returns came in. On the morning of November 4th, although not all the votes had been reported, Brian realized he had lost. Taft won 321 electoral votes to Bryan's 162, and Taft had a popular vote majority of more than a million. Scholars have attributed Bryan's defeat to several factors. Perhaps most important was the electorate's general satisfaction with Roosevelt's presidency and the assumption that those policies would continue under Taft. One slogan from this period, Republican slogan, was, Roosevelt has cut the hay, Taft is the man to put it in the barn. Also, Roosevelt and the Republicans had uh, already co-opted uh, several of the progressive ideas that Bryan had been promoting. And one scholar has said Roosevelt really didn't do a whole lot, but he went just far enough with reform that uh, he got the image as a reformer and it, it kind of kept down any, any popular complaints. On the other hand, because of this and other reasons, Bryan, Bryan and the Democratic Party really didn't have or failed to develop a compelling argument that they could use in 1908 why the voters should abandon the status quo. The, the Democratic slogan was something like, shall the people rule, and it was just kind of vague and fuzzy. In many ways, the campaign actually was a contest between Bryan and Roosevelt, and even during the campaign, they, they actually debated the issues in an exchange of letters and telegrams which, which were made public. And as I said earlier, Roosevelt pretty much took charge of Taft's campaign in terms of telling him what to do and when to do it. Although Bryan was disappointed and perplexed by his overwhelming defeat, he really wasn't bitter. He said he felt like the drunken man who tried to pass by a doorman to get into a club. On his first try, the drunk was gently pushed down the steps. On his second attempt, he got inside the door and was thrown out. He tried once again and was violently ejected. Getting up and dusting himself off, the man remarked, I am on to those people. They don't want me in there. <laughs> and Brian apparently told that story fairly often. Judging from the number of books and articles already devoted to Brian, and others probably still being written as we speak, his place in American history seems secure. One hole to be filled is an examination of Mary Baird Bryan, his wife, and her role in her husband's political career. As Bryan scholar Robert Cherney has written, quote, no one has made an effort to examine her life at any depth or length, to study Bryan's career from her perspective, and to present her own quite impressive career in its own right, end quote. Uh, Mrs. Bryan earned a law degree and uh, was one of the first women ad admitted to the bar in Nebraska. And certainly she was uh, a tremendous help in, in Bryan's political career, if for no other reason than helping him answer and deal with all those letters they got. And uh, if you've been to Fairview, which uh, some of us here were not too long ago, uh, the exhibit in the basement shows has the Bryan office, and they had a double-sided desk where they sat across from each other, and probably so they could deal, help deal with this, this massive amount of correspondence. 
A century after his last run for the White House, Bryan has probably faded from the memories of many Americans, except for a lingering recollection, perhaps, of his p participation in the 1925 Scopes Evolution Trial. I like to think, however, that Nebraskans will not forget him. Tangible, tangible reminders of his Lincoln years include his first home down on D Street, which is greatly altered but still standing, at least the last time I looked it was, and of course Fairview, uh, his once rural, rural residence, which is now surrounded by what used to be called Bryan Memorial Hospital. If you go over to the Capitol building, you'll see Bryan's bus standing in the Nebraska Hall of Fame. If you come up to the State Historical Society Library and Archives, you can find all of his books or most of his books that he wrote over the years. His newspaper, The Commoner, which was published here in Lincoln, is on microfilm. If you went up to the museum collections uh, upstairs here, you could uh, find out that we have hundreds of examples of political memorabilia from the three campaigns and some of them like these postcards, but there are badges and buttons and all kinds of stuff. I think Brian's desk is in our collection and just a, a tremendous amount of material. And I think some of you will doubtless remember the Brian exhibit we had here at the museum in, 18, in 1996, rather, which was uh, during the centennial of his first campaign. And along, whoops, along with that exhibit, uh, we published a special issue of Nebraska History Magazine that has uh, well, all of the articles relate in some way to Brian and his career. And this, uh, this issue is still available if some of you didn't get it then or would like to, to get it now uh, when you go out to the museum store, they'll have it out there. It has several uh, really intriguing articles and several that re relate directly to this campaign. For example, uh, one of the articles in here was written by a, a scholar named Julie Green that is called The Making of Labor's Democracy, William Jennings Bryan, the American Federation of Labor and Progressive Era Politics. And it addresses this, this coming together of the labor and, and democratic uh, party in, in the 1908 campaign. There's also uh, an article in one of our older magazines back in the spring 1984 issue of Nebraska History by uh, Professor Coletta who wrote the standard biography of Bryan or the modern biography of Bryan. It's a three volume set. But his article in this particular issue addresses this business of who was the real progressive, uh, Bryan or, or Theodore Roosevelt. So that might be one you'd want to take a look at. And then way back in 1956, Nebraska had an article uh, about this 1908 campaign which basically traced Brian's campaign tours and all of the places he went and how many speeches he made every day. And uh, in this particular article, apparently uh, somebody in 1908 had uh, sat down and tried to figure out how much Brian had spoken and talked during the three campaigns. And I don't know really how how good this estimate is, but that particular uh, writer had estimated that as of 1908, if you count the other two campaigns, Brian had traveled a half a million miles, made 10,000 speeches, used 50 million words, and eaten 1,700 meals at railroad lunch counters. <laughs> In addition to Brian's enduring contributions to American political history, as the Lincoln Journal put it in 1908, Quote, he made Nebraska and its capital a household word throughout the world. And this is a postcard that's from that period that tries to uh, do a number of things with plays on words. But certainly there's, there's little argument that, that Brian did, in fact, during his day, make Lincoln famous. So uh, for those reasons and others I've suggested, I, I think it's, it's entirely proper that Nebraskans should remember him as one of our state's foremost citizens. With that, thank you for your attention, and if you have a question or two, I, I'd try to answer it or at least tell you where I think you might find the answer. Thank you. Can't really see, but yes. Did they have any children? Yes, they did. Uh, they had uh, three children, and uh, two of the, the the children were still basically here at home in 1908. Uh, Grace, I believe, was the youngest. William Jr., William Br Jennings Bryan Jr. was the next. And then their older daughter got married out at Fairview, but I don't think she was living at home in 1908. And uh, um, I don't know all, all the details of what happened to them, but I think if you go out here to the shop, uh, 
our former director's wife, uh, Barb Summer, wrote a little pamphlet. It's a walking or driving tour of Lincoln sites that are affiliated with the Bryans. And I was glancing at it before the, uh, before the, the program here. And I think it does mention more about the Bryan children. There's also plenty of other places you can find it. That reminds me of one other story that supposedly was told by the oldest uh, daughter, Grace, uh, not Grace, uh, Ruth, who uh, supposedly was out uh, at Fairview for some reason and she was uh, coming into Lincoln. And in those days, of course, the Fairview was in the country and there was a streetcar line that came pretty close. So she was going to take the streetcar into Lincoln and, and she got close enough. She just saw the streetcar starting to pull away and so she took off running and finally just grabbed onto it and swung herself aboard and uh, sat down and, and mentioned to the person she sat by that she thought she was probably the only, the only Brian who had run for anything and caught it. <laughs> uh, I don't know if that's a true story, but it's a good one. If nothing else, thank you for your attention. And uh, as I say, maybe stop by the museum store and take a look at the, the Brian things we have. And uh, maybe you'll find something you want to want to pick up and take home to read. Thanks again. Thank you. to monitor, et cetera. NRD that better. Uh, really. right at the end. and the, the ID system an early opportunity to figure out My suggestion is uh, much time to read. Additional. Post taking uh, in my email. have an opportunity. Have to provide down to the chairman. Other. Contamination by South Nation. The of the MB. First of all, 
doing a make that you shouldn't be held just stations I but if there and their waters uh to put in there you don't believe me or had that policy that this is the the we're told we use They the substitute. I You've got to, I've been everything I'll feel your flood plan. First of all, I I'm not uh, it's a contaminant I'd involve uh, send it I suppose Fortunately, from time to time, I think something, but And if it of D picking up. I think I define I uh, And then what? Just 
came out. Putting this.